we have to see Tibetan society like any other society is rife with differences of opinions of elite common divisions and, and class divisions and so on. Um, so, uh, and in that sense, you see a wide variety of different experiences and responses to these types of changes. Um, but that being said, I do think we can generalize that there's a very strong sense of grievance that, that has come with this very polarized, disempowering form of development. And part of it is expressed by the fact that Tibetans are just fundamentally very disadvantaged by the type of economic developments that are happening because these economic developments are very centered on the urban areas and they're controlled largely by outsiders, whether it be outside governments or outside companies or outside private investors. And, and those who can really profit from the economic conditions are those who speak fluent Chinese, who have connections with the outside and so on. So Tibetans are just fundamentally disadvantaged in this type of context. Uh, but that being said, it's I think it's also important to make, put the emphasis on the fact that you you can observe a lot of grievance, not just among the have-nots, but also the haves, also the Tibetans who do have the good government jobs uh, and who have up to recently been considered to be the loyal uh, most secure Tibetans for the Chinese government. And uh, we're seeing more and more, and I use the term cautiously, but nationalism among these Tibetans. And what I mean by nationalism in this sense is not secessionist nationalism. It's not about separating or anything like that. It's just about advocating for more local con control over the decision making of how development actually happens uh, and impacts the local communities. Uh, and it's a reaction, I think, to this form of disempowerment. And also a lot of what what Mao Tse Tung used to call uh, Han chauvinism, uh, subtle forms of discrimination uh, that that they experience as a result of essentially being ruled by outsiders.